future is now. People say oh, China's a long-term problem. And I'm like, it's a long-term problem, like acute heart disease. Well, first you got to like not die of a heart attack tomorrow. What's at stake is about money and freedom. Like, I think the Chinese understand, we understand it, people don't want to create huge territorial empires for its own sake anymore. Uh, for reasons that I think are obvious, you know, m- wealth comes out of intensive development, out of, you know, educated populations that are productive. But countries still have an interest in, in this kind of hegemonic situation and or hegemonic area where they can kind of be the arbiters and the beneficiaries of this large market area. Because, you know, when China rises, the world will quake and that's where we are. And so we need to get serious like a heart attack. Mr. Colby, good morning. Uh, Really good to speak with you today. Good morning, Michael. Yeah, pleasure. Your book, The Strategy of Denial, uh, American Defense in the Age of Great Power Conflict, uh, I've got it right here. Uh, Exceptional book. Uh, Congratulations. And I know you've been uh, busy explaining uh, your thesis, and you've been gracious enough to to fit me in and explain what that is and what that means, not only in in the grand strategic sense in in America, but particularly for Canada as well. For those that don't know, I'm I'm wondering if you you could briefly introduce yourself and uh, your your accomplished professional background. Sure. Thanks. And it's a pleasure to speak with you, Michael, and also, uh, you know, to talk especially to uh, to our our friends in the North uh, Canadian Canadian audience, because I think that'll be very, very important for both of us. Yeah. My name's uh, Bridge Colby, uh, and I'm currently a principal uh, at the Marathon Initiative. It's a small think tank focused on supporting kind of deep strategic work dealing with the, uh, the, the challenges of, of great power competition. So things like my, my book, my partners, there's uh, Wes Mitchell who's probably familiar to many Canadians who's the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. Uh, and I think, I think Canada, I can't remember if Canada has moved into the Western Hemisphere. Anyway, uh, I digress. But um, before that, I was in think tanks in various parts of the government, probably the most relevant thing I did uh, otherwise in the government in the Pentagon 2017, 2018, I served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development. It is a mouthful. Uh, and that the most uh, salient thing there is I was the lead official for the development of the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which is the U.S. government's kind of defense, you know, formal defense, well, hopefully real as well, but formal defense strategy and that, that experience, but more that kind of intellectual experience and, and sense of what, what the country needs and our allies need uh, is what motivated me to write this book. And, and on your book, obviously, going through the military, throughout the global war on terror, there was lots of hope, there was lots of aspirations, and, and your book seems to ground, uh, ground us back into reality. I'm wondering if you can really explain how you look at the world um, and, and what makes, makes up your, your thoughts on, on great power conflict and where we're going. Sure. No, thanks. I think ground is actually a good, uh, very good, uh, I've, I've kind of been using a couple terms, but I think ground is, is the a good sense because I think we became, uh, we in the United States and, and in some ways in, our, in many of our allies, uh, perhaps Canada too, I, I, I couldn't say, but we became kind of detached from the realities of international politics. Uh, and that was across um, both Democrat and, and in some sense it reached its apogee or its nadir under the Bush administration after 9-11 um, from the realities of, of international politics and, and, and what we need to do. And in a sense, connecting those uh, realities to what's in our interest. So, I mean, what, what, what really I, I ground the book in is not only a kind of a more, I would say, realistic point of view. I, I look at the world from, a, I would say, a kind of a traditional realist point of view. I don't have puts and takes on various scholarly debates necessarily, but just kind of looking at the world through that prism. Um, and grounding it in, in, in what's in the interest of the American people. And I, I say that not in a, in a zero sum way, but in a kind of a enlightened self-interest way, but that, you know, in a republic or a, I would assume, a, a, you know, a, a parliamentary system, the purpose of the country's foreign policy should be to serve the interests of, um, uh, of its people. And, and that's where I kind of ground it. And I think that you know, ending tyranny in our time or the rules-based international order or all these kind of concepts, uh, which many of which are kind of ethereal, lost connection to that. And we are now in a world, you know, that, that was a sort of a, an academic problem when the United States, along with its close allies, you know, I like the term, bestrode the world like a, a colossus, right? You know, it was, was so much more powerful than anybody else. What's the worst that can happen? So we could make all manner of mistakes and we did. Uh, but now that's not 
that's not the world in which we live. Uh, I like the, the quote attributed to Napoleon, apparently so does Xi Jinping, which is, you know, when China rises, the world will quake. And that's where we are. And so we need to get serious, like a heart attack, because, you know, that's the world in which we live now. And it's our, we, we, we actually have already passed through the chance to have a graceful transition. And now we're, we're in it. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do with this book is like, all right, this is the world in which we live. How do we recenter and reground? And then what does that require uh, sort of deductively? Uh, and, and that's why, you know, it's, it's written with American interests in mind, but I actually, one of the things I've been doing now over the last couple of months is really in this pleasure to, to speak to, to, you know, our friends up North is, is engage with our allies and partners, because at minimum, I hope it offers a window into how I think the United States should think. And I think because I'm a realist, I think structure will, will push us to in, inevitably think somewhat like this, uh, at least in the broad scope, hopefully in the narrow scope, but even also maybe offer a framework for, for our, our allies to think about their own security arrangements. That would be the ideal because it is, it is an enlightened self. It's not zero sum. It's, you know, our interests. I mean, we're neighbors. Uh, if America is worried about being dominated by China, then Canada should too, right? And I think the example of the Huawei stuff has certainly driven that home. But, but anyway, that was the sort of that's the that's the basic um, uh, approach. What I really appreciate about the book is that you don't come out and overamplify anything, and you see a lot of even experts will come out and say, you know, America's suffering from imperial overstretch, and and you know, all these really grandiose concepts that America's you know America's going to end tomorrow is is painful to listen to, and yet on the other side. Um, you have a number saying that we can continue to do the same policy you can carry on, but you you come out really early and say America is still a great nation. There's a lot of things that we do right, we, but we just need to have limits to power. And those limits to power you articulate uh, really clearly and you know, deductively throughout the book. And it's it's very clear you can follow the logic. But one of the clear points that that you point out is that with the limits to power that the U.S. faces, allies need to step up. Uh, I'm wondering if you can explain that a little bit more. Obviously, a huge question. Only this past week, we've seen Germany really pose some questions and, and the rest of the NATO alliance. I'm wondering if you can expand on that. Yeah, and this is a really important point because I think, um, I, I think, I mean, it's a little uh, colloquial, but I think of what I'm saying is like a, as like a cancer diagnosis or, or heart disease, that is the analogy I use more frequently. But, um, you know, the, 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 the latter group that you're talking about, the people that, that say that we don't need to change, and that's true among the sort of neoconservative right, uh, as well as the sort of, um, I, I mean, I think it's true of the Biden administration, but, but also, you know, sort of I don't know, Clinton administration types. I mean, I don't want to get personal, but, you know, that, that mindset, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that mindset is sort of saying um, we can still keep doing, we can walk and chew gum at the same time as the Pentagon press secretary said the other day. And to me, the analogy here would be like, if you have a heart disease, uh, you know, um, acute heart disease, uh, uh, diagnosis and your doctor tells you, don't worry about it. Well, it could be right. <laughs> maybe. Uh, but that also is probably more likely to get you killed in the near term. <clears throat> my, my, my medical, my Hippocratic, uh, approach is let's confront the problem, let's do it together, and then let's adapt, and that will be the best way to sustain our approach. And, you know, to kind of go back to the grounding point, there's been a lot of sort of romanticized uh, discussion of alliances in, in U.S. politics very recently, partially in reaction to the Trump administration, although President Obama was also not a, a romantic about U.S. alliances, if you recall. So there's, I think there's a, there's a kind of um, an, a, a real tension and probably a, a kind of a an acute tension between the way that, say, you know, President Biden talks about um, alliances sort of sacred and what's actually in Americans' interests. I mean, I was struck in the, in a, again, not to make it too contemporary, but but in the in the Pentagon's um, statement about additional troops to Europe, it was saying talking about the rules-based international order and the importance of protecting American allies. And I thought to myself, is there any attempt to connect those to Americans' concrete interests? And you can tell American, there's a lot of skepticism. Uh, on both sides of the political, across the political spectrum, about additional American um, intervention or engagement, and I think this this is sort of attempt to kind of pull the wool over our eyes is not going to help anyone. So my logic is okay. We have a problem in the world. We need to. There's more scarcity. It's more competitive strategic environment. Let's let's get really real. Let's get the facts out on the table, and then let's talk about it together and figure out what we can do together. And then when we do that, 
let's not have it be what I call the three musketeers approach, which is, you know, all for one, one for all, and act as if different allies have, you know, the same interests and same threat perception. But rather, I look at it kind of, again, through this realistic, you know, uh, lens, which is, okay, some countries are going to be more motivated to do cer certain things than others, depending on where they are, depending on how rich they are, depending on their history. Okay. So let's try to array that model together and do it together. And it might involve some fundamental changes and might not to the extent that we can keep things as they have been, that would be good because it's been correlated with you know, success and peace and so forth. And so that's the logic in which, which I'm taking it. And from that point of view, China in Asia must be the um, United States' overriding priority as a foreign policy goal. And particularly it's military because Asia is the world's most, economic, the most important economic region and only becoming more so. And China is by far the most powerful other state in the international system. And the only way we're going to prevent China from dominating Asia, which you know, I can get into, but I think is, is a fairly modest assessment of what their goals are, is for us to lead an anti-hegemonic coalition in Asia. And again, getting back to that interest point, it's mostly going to be Asian states that are directly threatened. Japan, Australia, Taiwan, hopefully South Korea, India. And I mean, you can see that. You can see how much Japan has changed over the last 10 years. It's not because they like us more, it's because they feel more threatened. And so that's, that's, the, that's the reality. Now, if that's the case, though, and if we're dealing with a, with a country that now, by some measures, is already a larger economy than ours, that creates scarcity elsewhere. And so we have to reckon with that. And in my view, we're going to have to reduce our efforts substantially, very substantially, not only in the Middle East, but also in Europe. And that's going to create a vacuum. And so my, my recommendation in this context is not to ignore the problem or act as if we can sort of paper over it, but rather to be clear and realistic, particularly with our European allies, and say, look, we don't want, you know, we'll stay in NATO, we'll stay supporting NATO, but it can't be like it's been certainly for the last 30 years or even back into the Cold War, where we're the leading overwhelming effort that's really serious. And instead, let's work together and the U.S. can take a different approach towards NATO and say, you know, we can support you, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, sub, we'll support your defense industry, we'll give you more political discretion. And so this to me is the, is the way forward. And I think, you know, I had a conversation with <clears throat> some French experts the other day. And, and to me, there's a natural alignment with, I, I think what the French are trying, President Macron has a way of talking about it that I think is uh, poisonous to, the, to this, but, it, but, it, but it's a much different approach than like Germany. And I think Germany is the key problematic actor. I mean, just to, just to be briefly, I think to bring it to the Canadian context, to me, I, Canada is one of the countries where I'm not exactly, I don't have a clear view. And again, I don't presume to say what Canada must hey, do, Ottawa, Ottawa doesn't either. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I think it's not clear to me where Canada should should put the weight of its effort. So, I mean, I think clearly Canada has a, a tremendously distinguished tradition of you know contributing to collective defense. I mean, much more proud than than our own, right? I mean, we didn't come into World War One until 1917, and we didn't come into World War Two until the Japanese attacked us two years after the start of the conflict. Not true for Canada. So. So I always, I always, uh, I always get embarrassed when people, you know, kind of uh, toot our own horn too much. But that, you know, that said, um, you know, I think there's clearly an American interest in Canada doing more. Obviously, it's a smaller economy and so forth, but it has highly developed. Its military is very well trained. It's used to dealing at high end with Americans and others. It's clear with other countries like Australia. Obviously, it's going to be not. Don't go in the Middle East. Focus on Asia. Germany. It's going to be. Look, you got to orient towards. The, German, the Russians and, and helping East defend Poland, Ditto, Norway. UK, I think, is basically, pro I, would, I encourage them in my engagements with them with a focus on Europe and maybe the, the Middle East and, and North Africa. Canada is, you know, geographically uh, is like us, right? So, um, you know, would it make more sense to Canada to work with us militarily and kind of geopolitically in, in Asia? But that's a heavy lift that involves a big Navy and an and Air Force. Or does it make more sense to Canada, you know, as it's traditionally done, to focus more on Europe and maybe, maybe stabilization measures elsewhere? I don't know. But I mean, that's the kind of the framework where I'm saying where I think Canada would, the logic would be, you know, highly, you know, capital intensive forces that only wealthy countries can support that can be projected out from, you know, because obviously North America, we're going to try to avoid defending our, our shores. So where does that, where's your, the best bang for your, your buck is, is the question to me. There are a number of key 
partner nations that I've, I've worked with and, and you have as well that are definitely pulling their weight. You look at the Aussies, you look at the UK, uh, the, the French, uh, Scandinavians and, 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 and Polish, but working across the alliance with, with NATO, there's a learned helplessness. And, and how does that become reformed? And, and Canada suffers from this as well, this learned helplessness and, and the free riding on you know, US defense guarantees. How, how does that become reformed? Is that institutional change? Is that more direction from Washington? How do you see that um, coming out? And without clear direction from Washington, I don't, I don't know how that's rectified. Yeah, well, I think we're moving in the opposite direction right now by, by focusing on reassurance and so forth. But I think this is something I'm thinking about actually right now, we're kind of building on the book. The book, I don't get deep into the, into how to do burden sharing better, but I think, look, we wanna use the available tools. The, the most important thing is to be clear and credible that we are going to shift. So we give warning and it's believed. So I think at this point, a lot of Europeans just don't believe that the pivot to Asia or whatever you gonna to wanna to call it is gonna happen. And ditto in the Middle East, people say, oh, they've been trying to get out of the Middle East for 10 years or something. No. Just, you know, as I was to continue the analogy, I was going back and forth to somebody at a conference yesterday who said, well, you know, people, uh, you know, there are cancer, you know, it's a cancer scare, but there are cancer survivors. And I was like, well, cancer can kill a cancer survivor, right? So just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And structure and deductive logic really suggest, more than suggest, I think, determine that this is going to happen. But we need to build on that structure by being clear to our European and other partners and allies that this is going to happen. So instead of saying, we'll always be there for you, Europe, don't worry, Germany, we should be saying, no, we're not going to, we're not going to put more troops in. In fact, the direction of travel is the other way where we're going to have to withdraw troops over time from Europe might not be the best time. We become so accustomed to being the leader, our political and diplomatic establishment, our expert class is so accustomed to us always being in the lead that they kind of can't let it go. But actually I think the arrangement the transatlantic particular arrangement here would be, you know, the U.S. is is less involved in Europe, but then also defers more on European political issues. And if the French or whoever, as long as they're broadly aligned on the China issue and on the Russia issue, we should take more of a back seat. So I think that's another thing where there's a there's a deal. And then we should also make it easier for Europeans to you know, buy our own equipment, but also more important, like European defense industry to profit more from their orientation. We can't expect them only to buy U.S. weapons, you know, not that it's just a military thing, but just, you know, enable them, drop some of the barriers to intelligence or other other transfers. These are the kinds of things that we should be that we should be we should be looking at. But I think that'll that'll help the transition. But I think we've already passed the point where it could be really graceful and, and easy. One point that I didn't see in the strategy of denials how to deal with the economic linkages. You do reference gray zone warfare. How do you separate? We look at Germany right now and the Russian gas interests, and then additionally with with China, the economic might that it has, and the fact that Wall Street has interests. There are interests on Capitol Hill. There's interest in every capital across the world with with Chinese in, interests and Chinese foreign influence, military pension funds being invested into China. I know that doesn't factor into your book, but how do you look at this? I mean, it doesn't bode well. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's actually interesting. I tend to be a little bit less worried about the economic uh, integration um, than some other people. And it's it's for a bit of a paradoxical reason. So I'm very focused on hard power and hard power is, you know, basically, well, economic strength, and then that how that translates into military power. So this sounds like um, I'm always going to be the bearer of bad news. But actually, it's a little bit the reverse, because or actually, it is the reverse, because because I think that hard power is what matters in the sense, in particular, when a country wants to get another country to do something it really doesn't want. Um, soft power doesn't do much even economic sanctions. I mean, I think our experience of the last generation or more has indicated that economic sanctions are very limited in their utility. I mean, even the sanctions on Iran in the middle of the last decade were fairly narrowly tailored. I mean, we've had the embargo in Cuba, we've used sanctions against North Vietnam and Vietnam and then North Korea, Iraq, they didn't work. And so, um, you know, I think in, in, in the context of China, I think China is gonna find, and Australia is a perfect example of this, China is gonna find it difficult to turn economic leverage into really decisive political um, results, you know, to, to the extent that we're worried about. That what we worry about is that countries might, you know, forego their, their autonomy and get out of this anti-hegemonic coalition so that they do what Beijing says. And it's going to be very hard for China to turn economic leverage. And again, Australia, you know, very dependent on exports 
to China. So, you know, a pretty like a perfect test case for China. And actually they are having the, the opposite results. I mean, the Australians are running closer to us. I mean, I would say they're our best ally in the world right now. They, they pull their weight and they're really focused on the main problem. In fact, they're more focused than we are. We should listen to the Australians more. Um, so, so I think that's, that's sort of the good news. That makes me a lot less worried about Chinese influence and economic influence. I also, you know, we're Americans, you know, live free or die, don't tread on me. I don't like a lot of this disinformation, misinformation stuff for kind of like free speech things. But even more from a strategic point of view, I, I don't think it, I, I think it'll be counteracted. So the Wall Street stuff, yes, there's, there's influence in Wall Street and there will be, but um, there's counteracting influence. I mean, the country is moving in the opposite direction. So, so that, and, and, and Wall Street's not gonna be able to convince America not to defend Taiwan. One or the, I mean, people know that there are dovish, a lot of dovish people on Wall Street on that issue, but actually the direction of travel is from the other. So, so that's good news. Um, and, um, but that, that, so it's not that I haven't, didn't, and I, I, I don't want to be def defensive, but I didn't, it's not that I didn't think about the economic part, but in this context of, of the anti-hegemonic coalition ensuring the balance of power, it's not sufficient, it's not the key issue that we need to solve right now. But it also means that we can, I think longer term, and I think where, if we get the military piece right in Asia, the, the question of what our economic relationship with China will be is, is one of the big critical open questions though. I don't think we, because of the logic, I don't think we need full-scale decoupling from China. I, I think we can have heavy trade with China, you know, for, because of this reason also, but there's a lot of money to be made in China. I, I'm skeptical of those who say that China's about to fall apart, but we are gonna need to be very selective about, well, not be very selective, I should say. We need to identify the areas or the degree of exposure that we can't afford and that our allies can't afford. And that's a relative context. But I think that the Nord Stream 2 thing is a great example where it's a very, I mean, that seems crazy to me, where it seems like a very clear thing that the Russians can pull that, that lanyard and you know, half of Germany is freezing or whatever it is, right? I mean, that's crazy why they would do that. That kind of leverage, we don't want to give the Chinese. But where that is in, in, in between those two extremes, um, I, don't, I don't exactly know. I mean, I, you know, the, the Canadian example with, with Huawei, and I mean, I assume this is kind of, you know, going to come into the, the Canadian conversation as well. But I think for us in Canada, probably, you know, being neighbors, I'm not as, I think we need to onshore, you know, semiconductors in, support industrial policy at home and, and in North America to make sure that we have scale. Um, but I'm not saying, I don't think we can, we need to cut off all trade from China. Now, pulling it back, can you explain in a little bit more detail the, the absolute shift in the, you know, geostrategic environment and, and why the strategy of denial is so important now? Sure, I mean, it's, it's really very simple in my view. It's that China is so much more powerful than anything else that's, that's in the international system. And, you know, again, like, it, you know, the way I look at the world, what matters is, is, is power when you're deciding how to orient your foreign policy. And actually, I think in domestic policy too. I mean, I, people sometimes say that, that this kind of approach that I have is inconsistent with American political tradition. I actually think the reverse. I actually think the American structure is actually quite realistic in this way. The, the, the distinctive character of the American political system is a division of powers, is separation of powers, right? Because nobody can be trusted with too much power. It's the same logic, right? So, you know, I mean, Kim, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un might be a worse person than Xi Jinping. I don't know. I don't know how you would judge that. You know, it's for God to judge, I guess. But, but the fact is that China can do so much more damage in so many different ways, either with what it has now or with what it could produce. And so that's what you need to take count of. And, you know, capabilities are there and they grow and intentions change because people change their own minds and they can change their minds very quickly or new people come into power who want to do things. Um, and so that's what we really need to focus on. And I also think that China, I mean, China, what are China's goals? Well, China continues to produce evidence faster than I can imagine it of what their expansive goals are. I mean, the Equatorial Guinea base the other couple of weeks ago was like the most, I mean, I was like, I, I had to look, you know, where is it on the map? It's on the Atlantic coast. I mean, for people who say that China's ambitions are really constrained, they're looking to build a military base on the Atlantic coast of Africa. I mean, it's like the other, literally the other side of the world from them. And they're building a Navy to do it. And a Marine Corps and Air Force and space architecture, and they've got commercial interests. So, you know, that's it. <laughs>
it's like, how did the British empire spread? Well, it's, I mean, it's different in some ways, but it's not that different. You know, there's, there's and in politics, there aren't that many new things under the sun. So that's the reality we need to take account of. And the key is we got to get things right in the decisive theater. Now, in the old days, a hundred years ago, Europe was the decisive theater that if, you know, if, if Germany dominated Europe or if the Soviet Union dominated Europe, it would be able to use that wealth to project power and dominate the, the rest of the world. Well, now the central theater is Asia because that's where you know, economic productivity is now caught up with population size there. So that's just the, that's just the fact. And so the st strategy of denial is a strategy designed to deny China regional hegemony over Asia for the, you know, those reasons. And then secondly, a military strategy of denial, which is to deny China's ability to use its military to force countries within this anti-hegemonic coalition, especially ones tied to us, to basically disaffiliate and go on to, on, into their pro-hegemonic coalition or what, what have you. Um, and that's basically, if we can defeat their invasion, particularly of Taiwan, um, then we'll, you know, uh, it won't be perfect, but we'll be in a tolerable situation. I, the analogy I use here is, uh, or not the analogy, but the historical reference is, um, you know, Air Marshal or Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding said, you know, when he was overseeing the, the Battle of Britain, he said, my job is not to win the war here. My job is to defeat the invasion. But, you know, you can't have one without the other. And so because he was successful in that ability, they were ultimately able to meet the allies eventually were able to meet their political objectives. But if, if Britain had fallen, it would have been, you know, forget about it. So so that's the first we need to make sure we can do that. And then then we'll be in a decent situation. to, to and, and again, with I should stress uh, this is designed to deter and avoid war, but with the logic of, you know, if you want peace, prepare for war. And if you want, if you, that prepare for war is not a kind of like just theoretical thing. It's like the, the other side, if it especially it has a very capable and well-developed, mil, well-exercised military like China needs to see that if it does, if it pursues its best strategy, that will, that will be frustrated. That's the best form of deterrence. And that's what I think we you know, I think is the only prudent course for us. And how was your thesis re received in Washington circles, uh, the reception of the book and, and also foreign capitals? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, well, I mean, I, you would be a better judge than I am biased, obviously, but I mean, I think it's, it's been positively received. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, um, well, good reviews and all that. I, I guess I'll say at a macro sense, um, what I've been surprised to see a bit is I haven't had a sort of outright and developed counter argument presented. And that's sort of encouraging to me, uh, but also a little bit surprising because it's people don't take on the book's argument directly. They'll say things like, oh, Bridge, you know, or not to my face necessarily, but they'll say, oh, Bridge, like he's too extreme. We don't need to make these hard choices. The walk and chew gum argument. We need more balance. I get the equivalent of subtweeting. You know, it's sort of like, oh yeah, Bridge, like he's too obsessed with Taiwan and the military thing in China. And it's like, well, I think you're wrong. And I laid out why I think that's wrong. Uh, but I haven't seen somebody say, you know, why I'm wrong. So it's, you know, it's, and it's paradoxical because, you know, I think actually I get that a lot from the sort of neoconservative traditionalists. And there it's very strange because what makes neoconservatives neoconservatives is that they're liberals, yes, in the kind of international relations sense, but they're also realists, right? They try to combine it. That's what, that's the distinctive nature of hawkish liberalism, basically. But they have to take account of power. That otherwise, they're just soft liberals. I mean, I mean, soft power focused liberals. You know what I mean? Like just from an, so, so they they need to reckon with the military reality, and a lot of them aren't. So a lot of these chess beaters saying we should do a bunch more things in Ukraine. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Aren't you saying that Taiwan's under threat? So like, how does that? How does that square? You know, and 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 our defense, they're the ones saying that our defense budget's not big enough. So what gives? I don't get it. You know? So it's like I'd I'd I'd, I'd be interested to see what their counter argument is, but I haven't seen it. And then the other one, the, the other kind of implicit counter-argument is that basically that I think what to go to your question is that hard power is not so central. And that because and that basically in practical terms means that they don't think that China's gonna invade Taiwan or after that, the Philippines or Vietnam, that that's not gonna happen. And again, I haven't seen that argument fully explicated because it sure looks like they're getting ready to invade Taiwan. 
I mean, the Chinese ambassador to the United States literally gave an interview to NPR and was like, stop meddling here, we might invade Taiwan. You know what I mean? Like that's like basically the message. So that's been interesting, but it's sort of, I mean, it's, I guess it's gratifying, but it's also incredibly frustrating because we still are acting in the same bad way. We're still smoking cigarettes when we got a lung cancer diagnosis. You know, we're out there like sun tanning on the, or whatever those, those beds are when we have this, when we have melanoma and I'm like, what are we doing? Right. So that's, that's been, um, you know, foreign capitals actually, I would say, you know, I, I was talking and kind of making this point to the, the, the ambassador of a large European country in Washington. I made the point pretty directly. And at the end, I kind of was like, you know, um, by the way, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to be rude. I just, you know, my view is like, it's better to be frank and get it. And, and this person was like, no, this is great. Like, this is, I can reckon with that. I understand what you're saying. And I actually you know the French, I think I mentioned to you a French event I had on Monday, uh, earlier uh, on the 31st of January. Same thing. It was like, whoa, interesting. But oh, okay, I, I see, you know, I can kind of grapple with that. I'm not saying that they're agreeing with everything I say, but there's a, I think, a, and this is what I want, is there's like a coherence, a logic, a framework. And then let's argue about the puts and takes. And, you know, for instance, the, a lot of the French are like, well, no, we do have interests in the Pacific. Don't, don't try to com confine us to, to Europe. And it's like, all right, well, I mean, that, that's a good argument to be having yeah. um, within this overall context. So, so that encourages me. But the, the, the problem, Michael, is that we just, don't have any time. we just don't have time. We should have been having this kind of discussion five, 10 years ago. And, you know, it's all going to kind of be for naught if we are fried in Asia. Um, and I, I worry that that's where we're heading. It's, it's interesting that you bring that up. Um, it seemed like a lack of imagination and not worst case scenario, but realistic scenarios. And Admiral Stavridis' book, 2034, uh, exceptional sort of conceptual fictional account of what's to come. And after writing it, I think he wrote it pre-pandemic and a year later he was interviewed and he said, the only thing I got wrong was the date date. Yeah, I haven't read it, but that's my impression. I mean, Chinese attacks on ships in the South China Sea could happen like tomorrow. You know, so I think that's the future is now people say oh, China's a long term problem. And I'm like, it's a long term problem, like acute heart disease. Well, first, you got to like not die of a heart attack tomorrow. Then you can worry about your diet and your, you know, your weight, or whatever. But <laughs> we're in it, we're in the window. It, it, it seems odd facing the, the current crisis we're in that the point hasn't yet been driven home, what will it take to really shift the, the balance of thought? And is, at that point, is it, it we're, in a, we're in acute diagnosis? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, that's kind of where my head is now is like, what's it gonna take? I mean, I'm trying to bring as much urgency and directness to this debate to try to shift the Overton window and, and ideally policy um, without, you know, blowing up my credibility by sounding like I'm, you know, um, uh, absurd, you know, but I don't think anything I'm saying is absurd. I think everything I'm saying is true. I mean, I'm putting it in a sharp and clear and direct way. And I'll, you know, I want to talk to everybody. I want to talk to you and Canadians. I want to talk to America. I go on these radio tours in, in, or, you know, on radio interviews all around the country, obviously the, the blob and the, and, and the beltway, uh, but foreign countries. So I, I, what I'm trying to do in a sense is front load the reality, right? I mean, and, and that's, that's the, I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but you know, cliches are, have truth in them, right? And I mean, if we had anticipated even in 1934, what would happen and said, ah, let's keep, you know, and I say this as somebody who's a non-intervention, I don't like getting in foreign conflicts. I, I was against the Middle East wars, but like clearly it would have been better off if we had stayed in Europe with some force in the interwar period, and Hitler might have, you know, if he'd been deterred from going to the Rhineland or going into Czechoslovakia and ultimately invading Western Europe, you know, I mean, a lot fewer people would have died. But then in those days, in 1941, when we were bombed by the Japanese, we were the largest industrial power by leaps and bounds in the world. We were the largest shipbuilding industry. You know who that is now? China. So we can't just fall back on that. Um, and in, in the Cold War, I think the reason that we were successful is we pursued the logic that I'm pursuing. I mean, it's an homage in a way, is to say, and I use this phrase, imagined wars in, in the book, is like, they were always thinking, what would a war go like? So how am I best prepared, you know, reason within reason, in order to convince the other side that it's not worth it? And, and I think 
you know, the proof is in the pudding. We did a much better job during the Cold War by, you know, having that balance. And, and I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm, it's very frustrating. Part of me thinks um, it's too foreign policy expert still. I mean, if there's a war over Taiwan, like it's going to, a lot of people are going to be killed and um, our, our lives are going to fundamentally change. I mean, inflation presumably would like go through the roof because of the interruptions in supply chains, et cetera. Um, so maybe I, I need to be more like sharp. Like, I mean, I, you know, the point I make is, um, you know, when, when China fell, when, uh, when the communists defeated uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, that was a nasty political period in the United States. I mean, that was a very nasty political period. I mean, if, if, if China invades Taiwan and we lose, it's going to be, I mean, there's going to be, I mean, look at all the 9-11 commission stuff. I mean, that was one event by Al Qaeda. I mean, that was not a geopolitical, fundamental geopolitical shift. I mean, we've never lost a war to a great power. Um, and, you know, we, we, we decided to give up in Vietnam and Afghanistan and all that. I mean, I'm not being defensive about it. It's just a you know reality. I I think you know I'm I, I think people should be really worried. I think if you've been out saying oh yeah we can walk and chew gum at the same time or we can go into Ukraine and we can keep going in the Middle East and we have, and and we lose in in, in Asia, you're going to be in. There's going to be a lot of scrutiny and there should be. But I I I don't know. I but at the same time I don't want to like. I don't think it's constructive or right to get you know ad hominem or you know defam obviously defamatory is you know would never do that but but i don't know that's what i'm trying to what i'm trying to use every lever i can think of and, and is this more outreach to to the rank and file in the military or is this a broad outreach across across society there's there's uh, every western nation faces it in that the, yeah. the military and the foreign policy class are just completely separated from the, the just absolute peaceful existence really since the second world war i mean yes vietnam right. but um it's been a long time yeah yeah, I mean, in the U.S., it's a little bit different, but even the the, Amer the military is becoming almost like a separate caste, you could even say. I mean, in the sense that it's almost literally substantially hereditary at this point, point. Um, and they live on base, you know, often, and they're cycled through. And so, I mean, I think your point even holds here. Um, but, um, I mean, I think... Uh, uh, yes, I'm speaking to the military, although more, it's very important audience, but more with the goal of trying to uh, catalyze reform within the military to get, because it's like a multi-vector thing. So for me, you know, the success of the national defense strategy, the national defense strategy is just as you know, a paper at the end of the day. So it's, its values is in its impact. Um, and like success for the national defense strategy of 2018 is like what the Marines are doing. I don't know if you followed that, but you know the commandant of the Marine Corps, General General Berger, totally gets it. He's like, okay, this is where we got to shift. I got to change the Marine Corps in order to, and then think about what the operational concepts and ideas and posture are to support that political military strategy. And that's exactly what we want. I don't, you know, it, is every decision that General Berger was making the right one? I, I don't. I would not presume to say, but you know, I'm probably he's probably not. But I mean, part of it. it Part of this is is an iterative and ongoing development process, but it's like you want your, you want the military to be figuring because I mean you can get your grand strategy right, but if you don't get the military strategy right, it's not necessarily you know I mean and I, I like to use historical examples, but like um, well I mean the British did go in force uh, unlike in 1914 and 1940, but the military strategy failed right I mean the Germans went through the Ardennes and they defeated it, or in 1914 the British got the grand strategy right, I mean, people who say that countries can't make tough choices or focus, Britain resolved, I mean, you know, there was a war plan, American and British war plans across the Canadian border until like the, you know, 20s or 30s or something like that. But Britain, I mean, that was a little later, but Britain resolved serious rivalries with the United States, where almost fought a war in the 1880s. Obviously, we'd fought a number of wars before that, almost fought a war in 1840s. Japan over disputes in the Pacific, France, of course, the hereditary enemy, and Russia, the great game. Britain resolved all of those to focus on Germany. You know, I just think, I mean, this is easy for me to say, but if, if Britain, and to me, the lesson of World War I, and I think this is relevant to the 
deterrence and prevention of war point is yes there was there was the spiraling problem yes that existed but i think if britain had been in force on the continent in the way that it eventually ended up being you know not not just the colonial british army but the british army that was mobilized by 1915 1916 maybe the germans would have said no i'm not going to do this you know i mean the the germans had a disdainful attitude towards the british army so they discounted it they went through belgium but you know, if Germany had faced a more effective deterrent and defense, then its whole plan wouldn't have worked, right? Because France was the, was the well, I guess Russia was the main enemy. But, but, but anyway, like if they'd faced a co serious Amer Anglo-American force and even ideally Americans, uh, or at least the, the presumption of American support and involvement, that would have been different. And that's what we did in the Cold War and we had a better, better result. So, um, so it's critical that we, we you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, there's, there's the blob, the foreign policy class, there's the merit military, there's our allies and partners, politicians, regular people, because we're a republic, so morally, but also realistically, they need to understand and be bought in. And I think there is in the United States, at least, that China, the understanding of China as our primary challenge has really grown and, and is, it's higher on the right, but it's, it's now uh, across the political spectrum. So there's a lot to build on. But again, the, the question is, is, is time and urgency and scale. In addition to uh, the strategy of denial, which I highly recommend anyone read. Um, you said that you haven't come across a book that's challenged it. it what book right now complements it the best in, 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 in your mind? That's a good, that's a good question. So I like um, Chris Bros's book, um, uh, The Kill Chain is a very good uh, book in terms of thinking more about how the military should should radically overhaul. I mean, Chris is a very, well, he's a very sophisticated and, and, and brilliant guy, but also very kind of forward leaning. I mean, again, every point it may not prove to be right, but it's that, kind of disruptive thinking. Um, books, um, well, I commend uh, a book that will be coming out in the next year or two from my, my partner, Wes Mitchell, which is gonna look at some of the diplomatic aspects of this. Um, hmm. and, and maybe I could expand that to, to historically, yeah. what uh, student of history, uh, you bring up a, a number of historical references to, to frame your thinking right now. What period in, in history or what author do you think sort of illuminates uh, reaching back? A great question. I think there's a guy, he's a little bit obscure at this point, although he's a very prominent academic named Robert Gilpin, who taught at Princeton for many years. Um, but his books that he wrote, wrote sort of in the 60s, 70s, 80s, he, he did something that's very relevant right now and has never been done very well, either in the, in the academy or, or government, which is he really brought security and kind of hardcore geopolitics and political economy together. So he's a great scholar of both. He wrote a lot about uh, transitions in, in, in sort of system. I mean, we were going, for, we went from bipolarity to big powers, US, USSR to one big power. And now we're kind of going back into a new kind of bipolarity. I think obviously there are some degree of multipolarity, but basically two big actors. That's transitions are when things get really hairy um, often he wrote a lot about that, but also then he brought in the, the, the political economy. And that's in a sense, what's at stake is about money and freedom. Like, I think the Chinese understand, we understand it, people don't want to create huge territorial empires for its own sake anymore. Uh, for reasons that I think are obvious, you know, m wealth comes out of intensive development out of, you know, educated populations that are productive. Um, but but countries still have an interest in, in this kind of hegemonic situation and or hegemonic area where they can kind of be the arbiters and the beneficiaries of this large market area. And, and Gilpin was the one who really, I think, has been the most insightful in kind of plumbing those, uh, those, those, those depths. Um, but, you know, it, it's been a little while, but it's um, Edward Lutvok's stuff uh, is very good. His Kaplan is very good. So yeah, I mean, those, those, those are some of the key ones I think of. Mr. Colby, thank you very much for your time today. That was great. And uh, best of luck on uh, pushing the agenda. Thank you, Michael. Really, really enjoyed it. And keep in touch. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. All right. Be well. Thank you. Bye -bye.